One, organization. One of the biggest mistakes I see new producers make is a lack of organization. They'll grind around the internet downloading countless presets and just throw them in their designated synthesizer sound bank and just leave them. Uh, so now when they go looking for specific sounds, so let's just click on this and go down, they're going through just an uh, endless supply of just different presets and stuff like that. And uh, most of the time they're, uh, you know, naming their stuff something uh, just totally ridiculous. Like explosion <laughs> or disrupt <laughs> something stupid like that anyways uh, so what the best thing you can do is to take the time and categorize your things right here look if you go into your PCM synth and you have stuff organized click on here look you want arps there you want bass bells brass choir they're all there you put a thing for your favorite so you can be like, oh, this is what I use all the time. Oh, there's some FX, guitars. Here's all my presets I made. This is going to save you such a long time. Now, this can be a tedious process. So, like, if you, for instance, I did my beatbox, all my drums the other night. It, it took about, I don't know, it took about a couple hours to do the whole thing. But I got rid of tons of stuff I never used. And now, if I need something like, okay, hip-hop trap. Just go in there. I got all my stuff that I need for everything for trap. You know, you go for your into the dubstep. There's all your dubstep stuff. It beats just searching and searching for a bunch of different stuff. So this is definitely good to um, to make sure that you're nice and organized, and you will save your precious time. Monkey see, monkey do. Another huge mistake I see beginners do is they hear some knucklehead on YouTube tell them to uh, always compress your drums. So they do it without knowing why they're doing it. There's a lot of misinformation on YouTube and you should take information with a grain of salt, mine included. I'm not a professional and I have given some bad advice in the past before, but I try to give reasons behind my advice so the person watching can discern the information and decide on their own whether they should take it or not. Take the time to learn your tools and to use them correctly. I've seen tons of projects where people put on compressors on their tracks and they weren't even working. If the LED meter isn't lighting up, no compression is taking place. You can end up doing more harm than good in a lot of cases. I, I could confidently say if someone tells you, oh, always have your compressor here, or always put your limiter to right here and then have that right there. Like, they have no idea what you're talking about because there is no magic setting pretty much on anything when it comes to music. Everything is on a, on a, a daily working environment. There is hardly ever like, okay, this is where you want your EQ and this is right there. Like that just doesn't happen. Everything is so different. There's such variety in music that there's never, I mean, there's hardly ever uh, a magic setting for things. It is okay to experiment and try things. I mean, that's how you discover new stuff. But don't just do something blindly because someone told you to. The number one rule is to trust your ears. Number three stereo width. When I first started out making music, I never panned any of my tracks or sounds. Everything was dead center and it was killing my stereo width. Try panning your secondary hi-hats or your um, or your FX, your toms, your perks, you know. Uh, try doing, uh, try kind of experimenting with stuff like that. Uh, keep your main kick drum and snare in the center, like have it just straight uh, up in the center but you know uh in your base but for everything else they it can pretty much be panned um you can move it around try different stuff if certain elements seem to be clashing try separating them slightly to the left or to the right uh every element in your song has a living space and some sounds live well together uh but some don't so here's a set of different sound effects that i have So, notice how some are panned, some are in the center. Um, just try different things like this. So, I have a, a thing right here where they're just all 
um, kind of pan. So we could just kind of listen to this and it gives a more of a stereo width. Uh, listen to headphones, your, your phone is mono, so you're not going to have a stereo effect to it. But if you're listening through headphones, you'll be able to hear the difference on where the sound's kind of coming from. We could just loop this, I guess. So you can also do it with uh, with your melodies and your synthesizers and stuff. If you have a good pattern going on and it's clashing with something, so for in this case, I have a melody and a thing with the hi hats. Um, this sound was clashing with with this sound. So what I did was I took it. Uh, at first, I tried to kind of EQ them, and and it seemed that nothing was working. So I'm like, okay, like they don't really need EQing because this sound good. Um, but what I did was I took the melody and slightly panned it to the left, and I took the sticks, the hi hats, and slightly panned it to the right, and that actually created a very good living environment, so both of them could uh, could work together. Number four, layering sounds. You can achieve different sounds by adding two or three or even more sounds together. I do this a lot with my kicks and snares as well as my melodies. So when it comes to snares, say you find uh, some good ones. So in this case, I actually layered quite a bit of stuff on here. I layered this hammer, steam, uh, kind of a pop, and also Darth, Bra Darth Vader breathing out. So I um, I created I I layered them all together, making sure to uh, to not overwhelm any of the other ones because they're working together. So if I just solo this, all these sounds are working together. So there was a timpani as well the hammer, a different sounding hammer, and then, whoops, this breath. So I layer this all together to create a nice good uh, drum pattern. So for your kick drum, you can layer two different sounds. What I like to do is kind of find one where I like the very beginning of the sound, the transient. And what I do is just use the very tip of the sound. So you can take the decay and bring it down. So we're just getting kind of the transient here. And then we can also do one uh, that has a good long tail. And I like to use that for the body of it, kind of the decay of the sound. So what you can do is take the punch, which is the attack, and you can bring it down for the one that you want the body of, the long body. It sounds like this. It's got a nice tail on it. So I could take this out and get rid of the transient. Notice how it doesn't get that, that kind of snap at the beginning. So I use this and I can uh, adjust the decay and the punch uh, necessary on both of them. So they both create um, one drum sound that I like a lot more than just using each separate one. Now remember, they're not competing. You want to kind of marry the two together so they're working in harmony. So it will probably be necessary to adjust the volumes and just kind of mess with the decay and punches on some of them. So in the case of where I wanted the transient, I left the punch, which is the attack, and I took down the decay, so I just get the very tip of the sound, and it ended up sounding like this. And that's what I was looking for. So in the case of a melody, uh, it's easy that to create uh, two different machines with the same thing. So say you come up with a good pattern, you can copy the pattern and then paste it onto a different machine, and you can kind of sift through the presets to find something that sounds good together. So in this case, I used this to get kind of like a kind of a high pitch kind of plucky sound and i used this kind of for the for the main body part so together they sound like this Hit me with that So notice the difference if I, um, let's just mute the bouncy. Now we can listen to this by itself and we can hear what it sounds like.
big difference. So try blending two different instruments together. Number five, take breaks. It's extremely important to take breaks when mixing and producing. It's kind of weird how your mind will trick you uh, that something's sounding good the longer you listen to it. Sometimes a 15-minute break will do, or sometimes it takes a day or two. Uh, once you go back to your song, though, you will immediately notice if something is off and needs adjusting or changing. I don't know the science behind this, but it's definitely 100% real. It happens to me all the time because I get obsessed sometimes with my tracks, and I keep trying to fix stuff, and it's just, I'm like, oh, this sounds good, and then I'll come back to it. 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh, what was I thinking? You know, and that even goes for like your melodies and your drops, transitions. It goes for pretty much anything within music. Just take breaks and you'll notice the difference of when you come back to it. You'll immediately figure if something is good or not. Equipment. Now that you're getting comfortable with making music, it's probably time to upgrade a few things, but most of us are on a limited budget. First thing I would recommend would be to get a cheap controller. So most beginners think they need something with a bunch of dials and built-in effects that they're probably not even going to end up using. 99% of the time, your DAW has everything you need. So for instance, my controller has a built-in arpeggiator that I have never once used because it's so simple to create an arpeggiated note in a sequencer. So, uh, and e even with the dials. So in this case, it's like, what would you do? Oh, are you going to map your, uh, an effect with a dial or what are you going to do? Take your mouse and just bring it up. Like w it's on a daily working basis. Uh, there, you are probably, especially if you're beginning, you are probably not going to be mapping your dials just so you can move it on your controller instead of just taking your mouse and simply just adjusting it. Um, and a lot of people, they, and I, I've gotten into quite a few discussions about this with beginners and they try to, to justify why they're getting these things. But I've, I've had a lot of experience and it turns out like the, you probably won't be using these things now pads on the other hand are a bit different and i mean it all depends on how you kind of produce and what you're really looking for like i actually do recommend getting one with just a little bit maybe four or eight pads you don't need to go like total 16 pad get out of control and stuff like that um so i have pads and they have worked out in the past but for the most part i just program everything within the sequencer and i don't even use the pads but it's pretty much all what you're looking for but i maybe i do recommend getting a controller with a little bit of pads and you can get some cheap ones out there i also highly recommend a good pair of headphones so studio monitors can be extremely expensive and a good pair of headphones can be around 80 to 100 bucks. I recommend the Sony MDR 7506. Um, you want something with an EQ that is flat as possible. Uh, so a lot of headphones, they boost certain frequencies, which is very misleading um, for your mixing. Uh, there's actually a good article on why Beats by Dre headphones are not good for mixing. I'll leave that in the description. It's basically tricking you thinking, oh, no, this bass sounds good. Well, that's because your 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 lower frequencies have a boost in them inside of your headphones. So that's why it sounds good. But if you have a flat EQ on your headphones, you know you are hearing the proper sound that isn't manipulated in any ways. Sound design. Learning the basics of sound design, I feel, is the difference between going from a beginner to intermediate. When you understand the basics of how sound works and can be manipulated, you can start being in control of your projects instead of just helplessly sifting through random presets, hoping for the best. Take the time to learn how envelopes and filters, LFOs work. Learn the differences between sound waves. What's the difference between a sawtooth and a... Um, and a square wave, you know, these things are going to be uh, indispensable for you. They're going to really help you out in the long run. I have a dedicated playlist called Understanding the Modular Synth that goes into details of all this stuff. Or, or you could just look up YouTube tutorials and everything. There's some good stuff out there. Number eight, combining caustic projects. So there's only 14 tracks available within Caustic, and the more advanced you get, the more you're going to realize that that just isn't enough. 
Um, so what I recommend is actually using or creating two different caustic projects, one for your master and one for your sound design. Um, have one or two tracks dedicated in your, so in this case, I have one track dedicated to my samples here. Um, so I can load up, I could go to my other project, do my sound designing, do whatever I needed, and then I can uh, be sure to EQ them properly and put the your desired effects in there because once you bring your samples in here um, and you're using multiple different samples for multiple different sounds that you wanted, uh, you can't just throw on a distorted on one because one needs it, but the other one doesn't. You're going to affect every single sound in there. So... Um, Actually, I guess there's there might be a, there is a way there. You can do some automation by turning the effects on and off, but it's so much more simpler just to get the the desired sound that you want at the very end to be able to uh, uh, to use uh, properly without having to do too many uh, changes within your master tracks. Um, so you can load up. Um, so this is going to create almost an endless possibility of stuff that you can add in here. So in this case, I created a bunch of different sounds in a different project and I imported it into this one. So all these sounds that you're gonna hear right now are from a different project. <laughs> um, if I would have done that in this, it would have taken up eight different, different uh, tracks. Um, so, for example, we can just go to my, uh, this, and we can look down here. So, look how many different tracks it would have taken to create just those sounds. So, that's why it's good to, uh, be able to use a different caustic project, and then all you have to do is just say you wanted this. Um, make sure everything is, it doesn't really matter for the volume of it kind of does because you can adjust the volume within the PCM synth, uh, each individual sample within there and you can just go from there. Um, but make sure that everything's kind of EQ'd correctly. And then when you're ready to, uh, to take all your samples. Uh, so in this case, I didn't want the drums. So I had to, um, make sure that this one was, so you go to mute that one and then you mute the top one. And then now all you have is have all the sounds you wanted. And then you can go here and hit export. And then you go loop region only and then export. And then you have that, um, all those samples available for you. And then you can just load them in your PCM synth and you're only using one slot of like 80 different slots that you can use. So hopefully this video helped you out with some tips. If you didn't like it, please give it a thumbs down. Peace.